Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am Dr. Faryal Sheikh from the Department of Community Medicine. Today, the topic of our session is on water pollution and human health. These are the learning objectives of today's session on water pollution and human health. By the end of this session, students will be able to define water pollution and list indicators of water pollution. List sources of water supply and explain the advantages and disadvantages of each. Differentiate between the shallow well and deep well. Define safe and wholesome water and discuss the classification of water based on its quality and intended use. Define sanitary well and discuss the steps involved in its construction and maintenance. You will also be able to discuss the guidelines for drinking water quality which is recommended by WHO. And enlist the steps required for surveillance of drinking water quality. We will, you will also be able to discuss the health hazards related to the polluted water, define hard water and explain its drawbacks, and discuss the steps to remove the hardness of water. Since water is an important constituent of all living matter, 70% of the body weight of human is water. It is also a medium for transferring nutrients, waste matter, and maintenance of the thermal stability through heat transfer and evaporation. The water intake of an adult human being varies from 2 to 2.5 liters per day. But there are considerable variations between individuals as water intake is likely to vary with climate, physical activity, and culture. So, the quantity of water needed is dependent on the habits, hygienic standards of the population, as well as the climatic conditions. Water pollution can be defined as the contamination of the water bodies like oceans, seas, lakes, rivers, and groundwater, which make the water unsuitable for drinking, cooking, cleaning swimming and other activities. Some of the commonly occurring water pollutants are domestic waste, industrial effluents, insecticides, pesticides, detergents and fertilizers. Since water pollution is a growing concern in many developing countries owing to the human activity, human activity include the urbanization and industrialization. The pure uncontaminated water does not occur in nature. It contains impurities of various kinds uh, which could be natural or man-made. Natural impurities are not essentially dangerous. Natural impurities include the dissolved gases which include the nitrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, sulfide which may be picked up during rainfall and dissolved minerals which are the natural constituent of the water following its contact with the soil. Suspended impurities, um, for example, the clay, silt, and sand, mud, these are dry from the atmosphere, catchment area, and the soil. Natural impurities also include the microscopic organ organisms. A more serious aspect of the water pollution is caused by the human activity. The sources of pollution resulting from these are the sewage, which contain the decomposable organic matter and pathogen pathogenic agents, industrial and the trade waste, which contain the toxic agents resulting from the metal salts to complex synthetic organic chemicals, agriculture pollutants comprise of fertilizers and for pesticides. So next we have the physical pollutants, which include the heat, uh, which may cause the thermal pollution, and the radioactive substances. indicators of water pollution uh, the following parameters are regarded as indicators of the water quality these indicators deals with both biological as well as the chemical hazards now we have the amount of total suspended salt these are the basically are natural impurities uh, which we have uh, discussed in the previous slide as well so which are dry from the atmosphere catchment area and the soil Next, we have a biological oxygen demand at 20 degrees centigrade. Biological oxygen demand is an amount of oxygen required to nourish the bacteria in a body of water. Higher the biological oxygen demand, the less would be the 
dissolve oxygen which would be available for fish and other aquatic life forms. Therefore, the goal is to keep the biological oxygen demand level low and biological oxygen demand is calculated from a chemical equation test. The absence, next we have ab absence of a dissolved oxygen. Uh, before that, we should know okay, what is dissolved oxygen and what does it indicate. Dissolved oxygen is indicative of amount of oxygen available for life to survive in an aquatic environment. Survival of fish in aquatic life depends on the availability of oxygen in the water. Dissolved oxygen is affected by the presence of the metals, chemicals, nitrates, temperature fluctuation, and the organic life in water. Now the concentration of chloride, nitrogen and the phosphorus. The domestic wastewater, agricultural drainage water and industrial affluents contain the phosphorus and the nitrogen. This serve as a source of additional nutrient for aquatic organisms and cause the severe eutrophication of the lakes rivers and coastal water. What is eutrophication? Eutrophication is a process by which an entire body of water becomes progressively enriched with the mineral and nutrients, particularly the nitrogen and the phosphorus which will result in the health hazards. Next we have a uh, metal um, which, uh, which is also one of the indicator of the water pollution which includes the lead mercury, arsenic, cadmium and selenium. When uh, these metals ingested by the fish and after that they reach human to us, they may cause death when fish is consumed uh, these metals for a long period. This process is known as a biomagnification. They have uh, hydrocarbons in the industrial chemicals. Industrial organic pollution uh, pollutants, these are the elements enter the environment as a toxic micropollutants and grow through biomagnification. Three main sources of water are rainwater, surface water, and groundwater. Rain is a prime source of all water. A part of the rainwater sinks into the ground uh, to form the groundwater and when part of it evaporates back into the atmosphere and sun runs off to form the streams and river, it, mm, it will constitute a surface water and the, all the sources of surface uh, water mm, which include the impounding reservoir, rivers and streams, banks, ponds and lakes ultimately uh, flow into the sea. Some of the water in the soil is taken up by the plants and is evaporated in turn by the leaves. These events are spoken of as a water cycle. Now water impounding reservoir. These are the artificial lakes uh, in which large quantities of surface water is stored. Dams built across the rivers and the mountain streams also provide a large reserve of surface water. One disadvantage of storing water for long period in these impounding reservoirs is the growth of algae and other microscopic organisms which impart bad taste and odor, odor to water. Impound, uh, next is a tank uh, which is also one of the source of the surface water. Tanks are the large excavations in which surface water is stored. Tanks are the recipient of contamination of all sorts. They are full of slit and collide matter, especially immediately after rainfall. As we all know that surface water ultimately falls so, uh, into the sea. So, uh, sea water uh, is plentiful, but it has a great limitations. It contains 3.5% of the salts in solution. Uh, offshore water of salts and ocean have a salt concentration of 30 to 36 gram per liter. It also contains dissolved solid including chloride, uh, sodium and magnesium. Uh, however, desalting and demineralization process of seawater involves the heavy expenditure. Now what is groundwater? Ground, when rainwater percolating into the ground, it will constitute a groundwater. The sources of groundwater include the shallow wells, deep well and springs. 
Now, what is spring? When groundwater comes to the surface and flows freely under the natural pressure, it is called a spring. A spring may be of two types, shallow spring or and deep spring. Shallow spring usually dry up during the summer months, whereas the deep spring do not show the seasonal fluctuations in the flow of water. Shallow springs are also exposed to the contamination. As we know, rainwater is the prime source of all water. It is the purest water in nature. Physically, rainwater is clear, bright and sparkling. And chemically, it is a very soft water containing only traces of dissolved solids. Being soft, it has a corrosive action on lead pipes. However, bacteriologically, it is free from pathogenic agents. Rainwater tends to become impure as it passes through the atmosphere. Rainwater tends to become impure as it passes through the atmosphere. It picks up suspended impurities from the atmosphere such as dust, soot, microorganisms and gases which includes the ammonia, nitrogen, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Gaseous sulfur and nitrous oxide gases react with atmospheric water forming dilute solution of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. The precipitation of these acids which is called the acid rain have a serious impact on surface water quality and even on plants. Surface water originates from a rain water. It is the main source of water supply in many areas. Examples of surface water include the rivers, streams, lakes, man-made reservoirs. Uh, man-made reservoirs include the impounding reservoirs and tanks. And what are the impounding reservoirs? I have already discussed in my previous slide that impounding reservoirs are artificial lakes in which the large quantities of surface water is stored. Dams built across the rivers and mountain streams also provide large reserves of surface water. And the area draining into these reservoirs is called the catchment area. The surface water is prone to the contamination from human and animal sources. As such, it is never safe for human consumption unless subjected to sanitary protection and purification before use. Surface water picks up the characteristic of the surface over which it passes. It is surface water is grossly polluted and quite unfit for drinking without treatment. Uh, surface water supplies possess a high prob probability of organic, bacterial and viral contamination. Now, what is groundwater? Rainwater percolating into a ground constitute a groundwater. Water used by human mainly comes from land. Groundwater is the cheapest and most practical means of providing water to smaller communities. Uh, we have already discussed about the sources of groundwater in the previous slides. It includes uh, the shallow well, deep well, and springs. Groundwater is likely to free from pathogenic agent and it usually requires no treatment and groundwater is considered superior to the surface water because the groundwater itself provides an effective uh, filtering medium and it provides an effective means of the filtration and the supply of water is likely to be certain even during a dry season um, and it is and the less subjective to uh, contamination than surface water. The disadvantage of uh, uh, groundwater is that it is uh, it has high mineral content. Uh, minerals include the salts of the calcium and magnesium, which renders the water hard. Now we will discuss the difference between the shallow and deep well. The shallow well taps the subsoil water that taps water from above the first impervious layer in the ground. Above the impervious strata, there will be a porous strata. Whereas the deep well taps water from below the first impervious layer in the ground. 
shallow well uh, yield a limited quantity of the water and the chemical quality of a uh, shallow well will be moderately hard uh, however a deep well provides a large quantity of the water and the chemical quality of the deep well would be much hard shallow well may dry up in the summer whereas deep well does not usually dry up it provide a source of constant supply of the water now the bacteriological quality of shallow well is that it is grossly contaminated and shallow well is a health hazard to a community if they are not made sanitary uh, whereas a deep well uh, provide a, a better quality purer water and a deep but a deep well can also become a health hazard if it is open poorly constructed and not protected against the contamination uh, water intended for the human consumption should be both safe and wholesome safe and wholesome water defined as a water that is free from the pathogenic agents free from the harmful chemical substances it should be pleasant to the taste that is free from the color and odor and it should also be usable for the domestic purposes now what is polluted and contaminated water it is a uh, said to be what is said to be polluted or contaminated when it does not fulfill the above criteria of safe and wholesome water For practical purposes, water is classified as potable water, clean water, polluted water, and contaminated water. Now, what is potable water? Water whose quality is such that it can be used for drinking purposes is known as a potable water. Next is a clean water. Clean water is a one which at all time free from contamination and safe for the human consumption. And clean water is determined by the laboratory analysis, sanitary surveys, and continued use. A uh, third, we have a polluted water, uh, water which has suffered from impairment of the physical qualities of the water through the addition of the substances which is causing turbidity, uh, color, odor, or taste of the water. Fourth is a contaminated water. Contaminated water is the one which may carry infection due to addition of the human or animal waste, or which has been rendered unwholesome by hazardous chemical compounds. Now what is sanitary well? A sanitary well is one which is properly located, well constructed and protected against the contamination with a view to yield a supply of safe water. Now we will discuss the steps in constructing a sanitary well and these following steps should be taken into consideration by constructing a sanitary well. Number one is the location. The first step in well construction is choosing a proper site. If bacterial contamination is to be avoided, the well should be located not less than 15 meters, that is uh, 50 feet from the likely sources of contamination. The, also, the well should be located at a higher elevation with respect to a possible source of contamination. The, and the distance between the well and the houses of the users should also be considered because if the well is situated far away, people may not use it. The next step is lining. The lining of the well should be built of bricks or stones set in cement up to a depth of at least 6 meter or you can say 20 feet so that water enters from the bottom and not from the sides of the well. And the lining should also be carried 60 to 90 centimeter or uh, you can say 2 to 3 feet above the ground level. Now third step is a parapet wall. There should be a parapet wall up to a height of at least 70 to 75 centimeter or you can say 28 inches above the ground. Fourth step is a platform. There should be a cement concrete platform round the well extending at least one meter in all directions. Fifth step is drain. 
there should be a pakka drain to carry off spilled water to a public drain or a soakage pit constructed beyond the cone of filtration or you can say area of drainage of the well now the sixth step is covering the top of the well should be closed by a cement concrete cover because the bulk of the pollution is introduced into the well directly through the open uh, top and uh, there are certain studies uh, which have shown that merely uh, covering a well alone caused a marked improvement in the bacteriological quality of the water and open wells therefore cannot be considered sanitary however well they might be constructed otherwise now the seventh step in constructing a sanitary well is the hand pump the well should be equipped with a hand pump for lifting the water in a sanitary manner Studies have also shown that when a pump is fitted, there is a marked improvement in the bacteriological quality of the water. The eighth step is a consumer responsibility. The provision of the sanitary well does not guarantee freedom from the waterborne diseases unless the consumers observe the certain basic precautions at the individual and the family level. Strict cleanliness should be enforced in the vicinity of the well, washing of the clothes and animal, and the dumping of refuse in the waste should be pro prohibited. Ropes and buckets from the individual homes should not be used for drying a supply from the well. And all this requires the health education. And the ninth step in constructing a sanitary well is a quality. The physical, chemical and bacteriological quality of the water should conform to the acceptable standards of quality of the safe and wholesome water. Now the guidelines for the drinking water quality criteria and standard which is recommended by the World Health Organization relates to the following variables. Uh, number one is acceptability aspects and uh, it includes the physical parameters of the water and the inorganic conduit in the water. Physical parameters include the turbidity, color, taste and odor and temperature. In second is the microbiological aspects. In microbiological aspects includes the bacteriological indicators, bio, biological and biological aspects. In chem, third is the chemical aspects. In chemical aspects includes uh, the organic and inorganic constituent and pesticides. Fourth one is the radiological aspects, uh, which may be either somatic or hereditary. Now in this slide, uh, we will discuss about the acceptability aspects of uh, water quality, and it includes the two parameters physical parameters and the other is a in inorganic constituents so the acceptability of the drinking water can be influenced by many different constituents the, uh, these includes the turbidity color taste and odor and the temperature turbidity is a measure of relative clarity of a liquid drinking water uh, should be free from turbidity Turbidity in drinking water is caused by the particulate matter uh, that may be present as a consequence of inadequate treatment or um, as or from resuspension of sediment in the distribution system. It may be also due to the presence of inorganic particulate matter in some groundwater. Turbidity also interferes with the disinfection and microbiological determination. The next is the color. Drinking water uh, should be free from color. It may be due to the presence of colored organic matter. Metals such as iron and manganese or highly colored industrial based. The guideline uh, value is up to 15 true color units. Although the level of color above 15 true color units can be detected in a glass of water. The third is a taste and odor. Taste and odor originate from the natural and biological sources or processes. 
uh, from contamination by chemicals or as a byproduct of the water treatment, for example, chlorination. Taste and odor may develop during storage and distribution. It is indicated of some form of pollution or malfunction during the water treatment or distribution. An unusual taste or odor might be an indication of the presence of potentially harmful substances. And the fourth physical parameter is temperature. Um, cool water is generally more palatable. However, the low water temperatures tends to decrease the efficiency of a treatment process. Um, treatment process could be disinfection and may thus have a deleterious effect on the drinking water quality. Now in this slide we will discuss the uh, second parameter of acceptability aspect uh, which is the inorganic constituent in water. The first one is chloride. Since we know that all water including the rain water contain chloride and, and uh, since the chloride content of the water varies from place to place it is necessary to determine the normal range of chloride of the unpolluted surface in the ground water the given locality. The standard prescribed for chloride is 200 mg per liter and any excess over the normal range should arose the uh, suspicion of the water contamination result in the alteration the physical characteristic of the water which includes the taste. Second is the ammonia. Ammonia in the environment originates from the metabolic, agricultural, industrial processes and from the disinfection from, with chloramine. Ammonia in uh, water is an indicator of uh, possible bacterial sewage and animal based pollution. Now third is the hydrogen sulfide. The taste and odor or threshold of hydrogen sulfide in water are estimated to be between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 mg per liter. The rottenex odor of hydrogen sulfide is, pretty, is noticeable in some groundwater and stagnant water in the distribution system and it occurs as a result of oxygen depletion and reduction of sulfate by the bacterial activity. Uh, now fourth is the pH. Now uh, one the objective in controlling the pH is to minimize the corrosion and incrustation in the distribution system. If the pH level is, level is less than 7, it will cause the corrosion of the metals in the distribution pipe and elevated level of the certain chemical substances such as lead. And at pH level above 8, there is a progressive decrease in the efficiency of a chlorine disinfection process. So an acceptable pH of, of drinking water is, should be between uh, it should be between 6.5 and 8.5. The fifth uh, uh, constituent, inorganic constituent, is iron. So on exposure to the, the anaerobic groundwater may contain the ferrous iron uh, at the concentration of up to. Uh, 7 mg per liter without discoloration or turbidity in the water when it directly pumped from the well. Iron on exposure to the uh, atmosphere, uh, the, however, the ferrous iron oxidizes to the ferric iron, giving, an, giving a reddish brown color to the water. At level above the 0.3 mg per uh, liter, iron stains laundry and the plumbing fixtures. Now, uh, sixth inorganic constituent is sodium. The, um, at, uh, the average taste threshold for sodium is about 200 mg per liter and the taste threshold concentration of sodium depends on the cation associated anion and the temperature of the solution. Now, Seventh is a sulfate. The presence of sulfate in, the in drinking water um, can cause can um, cause a noticeable taste. 
and the taste impairment will be minimal at level below 250 mg per liter. Uh, we have nine, eight, we have uh, eight constituent is a total dissolved solids. The total dissolved solids can have an important effect on the taste of drinking water. The pal palatability of the water with a total dissolved solid level of less than six milligram per liter is considered to be good. And drinking water become unpalatable at total dissolved solids a level greater than 1200 milligram per liter. Now the ninth inorganic constituent is zinc um, and water containing zinc at concentration in excess of 5 mg per liter may appear uh, multicolored and develop a greasy film on boiling. And after zinc, um, the another in inorganic constituent is manganese. Manganese concentration below 0.1 mg per liter are really acceptable um, to the consumer at level above 0.1 mg per liter. Manganese in uh, manganese in water supply stains sanitary wares and laundry, and it causes uh, it it will alter taste in beverages, and it may also lead to the accumulation of deposits in the distribution system. Now the eleventh inorganic constituent is dissolved oxygen, and the depletion of dissolved oxygen in the water can encourage the microbial reduction of nitrate to nitrite and sulfate to sulfide and give uh, it will give rise to the odor problem it can also cause an increase in the concentration of parasite in the solution um, the 12th inorganic constituent is copper the presence of a copper in a water supply may interfere with the domestic uses of the water and staining of laundry and its sanitary wear occurs at a copper concentration above 1 mg per liter. And the last inorganic concentrated water is aluminium. The presence of aluminium at in excess of 0.2 mg per liter leads to the deposition of aluminium hydroxide flock in the distribution system, uh, which will cause the exacerbation of discolor, uh, discoloration of water. Now this table is uh, indicating the signs of contaminants in drinking water in the presence of the sand, dirt and uh, clay which it will increase the turbidity uh, in the water and results in the cloudiness whereas presence of the iron will, uh, will stain and discolor clothing uh, because of its brown red discoloration. And the presence of the minerals in the drinking water, which will result in the alkaline taste. And uh, the rotten egg smell of hydrogen sulfide results in the uh, gastrointestinal problems. And the uh, since we know that, that the presence of the fluoride at about 1 milligram per liter in drinking water is known to protect against the dental caries, However, uh, the high levels of fluoride in the drinking water results in the mottling of the dental enamel. It will uh, cause the um, damage of teeth enamel and results in the bone brittleness as well. Now in this slide, we will discuss the uh, second aspect of uh, water quality uh, criteria and standard which is the microbiological aspect and microbiological aspect is further divided into bacteriological indicator, virological aspect and the biological aspect. So in bacteriological um, uh, indicators, the primary bacterial indicator recommended for uh, this purpose is the coliform group of organisms. And the supplementary indicators include the fecal streptococci and the sulfide reducing Clostridia. And they are useful in determining the origin of fecal pollution as well as in assessing the efficiency of water treatment process. Ideally, the drinking water should not contain any microorganism known to be pathogenic. It should also be free from bacteria indicated of pollution with excreta. So, um, in coliform group indicates both the fecal as well as non-fecal organisms 
and the typical example of the fecal group is E. coli and the non-fecal group is Klebsiella. Uh, so if the coliformic uh, organisms are present in the water uh, supply, water sample, uh, it indicates the probable presence of intestinal pathogens. So in microbiological and bacteriological indicators, uh, we will um, look for three or presence of three organisms, uh, which indicates the water quality and their presence indicate the fecal contamination. The three organisms are the coliform organisms, fecal streptococci, and the Clostridium perfringens. Now, what is the WHO criteria of safety for large water supply? Is that the no sample should have E. coli in the 100 ml sample of uh, treated water entering or present in the distribution system. The second criteria is that no sample should have more than 3 coliform per 100 ml in um, untreated water. And uh, in case of large supplies, total coliform bacteria must not be present in 95% of the samples throughout the year. And for just no two consecutive samples should have coliform in 100 ml. The persistent presence of E. coli indicates the constant fecal uh, contamination and it renders the water unsafe for drinking purposes. Now we will discuss the second supplementary indicator that is the fecal streptococci. Um, the presence of fecal streptococci in the water is regarded as important confirmatory evidence of recent fecal contamination. The Another uh, supplementary indicator is the Clostridium perfringens and the presence of spores of the Clostridium perfringens in a natural water suggests the fecal contamination has occurred and their presence in the absence of the coliform group of organisms suggests that the fecal contamination occurred at some remote time. The second aspect of the uh, microbiological aspect is... Um, virological aspect and uh, drinking water should be free from any viruses. This infection with 0.5 mg per liter of free chlorine residual after the contact period of at least 30 minutes at a pH of uh, 8 is sufficient to inactivate virus. And the third microbiological aspect is a biological aspect and drinking uh, water uh, should be free from pathogen uh, pathogenic intestinal protozoa, which includes the halmins, giardia, free living organisms. Protozoal species are transmitted by ingestion of the contaminated drinking water. It includes the giardia, entamoeba, stolitica, and stolitica, and can be introduced into water supply through the human or uh, animal fecal contamination. Now we will discuss the third aspect of the drinking water quality criteria and standards which has been recommended by WHO to determine the water quality. That uh, third aspect is a chemical aspect. The presence of a certain chemicals in excess of the prescribed, limit, uh, prescribed limits may uh, constitute ground for rejection of the water as a source of water supply. supply. These substances may be inorganic or organic. Inorganic constituent includes the arsenic, cadmium, chromium, cyanide, chloride, lead, mercury, nickel, uh, nitrate, and selenium. Arsenic, uh, first is arsenic. Arsenic is introduced into the water through the dissolution of minerals and ores from industrial effluents and from atmospheric deposition. Uh, and its concentration of arsenic in groundwater is sometimes elevated as a result of erosion from natural sources. A, pro a guideline value for arsenic drink uh, drinking water is 0.01 mg per liter. Now, cadmium is uh, uh, released into the environment in the wastewater and diffuse pollution is caused by contamination from fertilizers and local air pollution. Cadmium uh, primarily accumulates in the kidney. A guideline value for cadmium is established at 0.3 microgram per liter. Now the um, chromium, uh, the guideline value for chromium is 0.05 milligram per liter, uh, which is un, uh, which is considered to be unlikely to give rise to the uh, significant health risk. Now uh, next is the cyanide. The acute toxicity of the cyanide is high. Cyanide uh, 
can be found in uh, foods as well and and they are usually found in the drinking water primarily as a consequence of industrial uh, contamination and it has a, a adverse effect on thyroid and the nervous system as a consequence of a long term consumption of inadequately processed plant uh, that is a, a sour containing which contains a high level of cyanide um the next in organic constituent is fluoride uh, since um, the uh, guideline value which is suggested for fluoride is 1.5 mg per liter and uh, uh, if excess or as we all know that excess fluoride which will result in the dental or skeletal fluorosis or it will result in a moulding of the dental enamel and uh, exposure to the fluoride from drinking water depends on the natural uh, circumstances and le its level uh, uh, level of fluoride in raw water are normally below 1.5 mg per liter uh, now the another uh, inorganic constituent is lead lead is a general toxicant uh, that accumulates in the skeleton lead interferes with the calcium metabolism both directly and by interfering with the vitamin d metabolism and lead is toxic to a uh, central as well as a peripheral nervous system inducing it uh, to induce the subencephalopathic neurological and behavioral effects so uh, the health based guideline value of lead is 0 0.01 mg per liter uh, next is the mercury mercury is present in inorganic form in surface uh, as well as in ground water at a concentration usually less than 0.5 g per liter microgram 0.5 microgram per liter and the kidney is a main target organ for inorganic mercury, whereas methyl mercury affects mainly the central nervous system. And the guideline value for total mercury is 0 0.006 mg per liter. Um, other uh, inorganic constituent uh, is uh, 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 nitrate and uh, nitride. Nitrate and nitride are naturally occurring ions as a part of the nitrogen cycle. Naturally occurring nitrate level in surface in the groundwater are generally a few milligrams per liter. And in, uh, in many groundwater, an increase in the nitrate level uh, has been observed due to the intensification of the farming uh, practices. And the guideline value for nitrate in drinking water is to prevent the methemoglobinemia, which depends of, upon the conversion of nitrate to nitrite. Now, uh, another uh, inorganic constituent is selenium. Uh, selenium levels in drinking water vary in different uh, geographical areas and are usually much less than the guideline value of 0 0.01 mg per liter. Selenium is an essential element uh, for human and form an integral part of the enzyme glutathione for oxidation. The tox its, the, its toxicity results in uh, due to the long um, uh, its toxicity is manifested in nails, hairs, and uh, liver uh, because of the long-term exposure of selenium. And uh, now uh, we will discuss the these that were the uh, inorganic constituents. And uh, now we will discuss the organic constituents, which include the carbon tetrachloride, vinyl chloride, aromatic hydrocarbon, and uh, which results in the uh, deterioration in the water quality. And uh, mm, it also includes the pesticides. The pesticides are of importance in connection with the water quality. It includes the chlorinated hydrocarbon and their derivatives. It includes the herbicides, soil insecticides and pesticides are uh, leached out from the soil uh, and are systematically added to the water supply for disease vector control. Uh, now, these are the allowable chemical concentration of inorganic constituents uh, in um, 
uh, drinking water and if uh, uh, these are the guideline value for, for various inorganic constituents in the drinking water and if the concentration of these inorganic constituents exceed in the drinking water so uh, then it will uh, result in a health hazard. Now we will discuss the uh, fourth aspect of the drinking water quality criteria standard which has been recommended by WHO and uh, this is this aspect is called the radiological aspect. A radiological aspect may be uh, somatic or hereditary. Uh, so what is the somatic uh, radiation exposure? So the effects of radiation exposure are called somatic if they become manifest in the exposed individual for example carcinogenesis and they are called hereditary if they affect the descendants. Malignant disease is the most important delayed uh, somatic effect. For some uh, somatic effect is carcinogenesis, the probability of an effect occurring rather than its severity is regarded as a function of a dose without a threshold. Uh, this, it is called the stochastic effect. Yeah, whereas uh, for the somatic effect, the severity of the effect varies with the dose uh, and uh, for non stochastic effect, the threshold will exist for uh, such effects. So the aim of radiation protection is to prevent the harmful non stochastic effects uh, and reduce the probability of stochastic effect to a level deemed acceptable. And uh, therefore, the radio uh, radioactivity in drinking water should not only be kept within safe limit, but also within those limit be kept as low as it is reasonably possible. Uh, now, uh, we will discuss the surveillance of the drinking water quality. The aim of uh, surveillance of drinking water quality is to protect the public from uh, waterborne diseases and the elements of surveillance program include the sanitary surveys, sampling, bacteriological surveillance uh, which include the identification of the core presumptive polyphone test, detection of fecal streptococci and necrosis and perfringence, colony count and the biological examination and the uh, last one is the chemical surveillance. Uh, now we will discuss the elements of the surveillance of drinking water quality uh, which includes uh, uh, the first one is a sanitary survey and uh, the sanitary survey is uh, an on the spot inspection and evaluation by a qualified person of the entire water supply system. And the aim of uh, this survey is the detection and the correction of the deficiencies in the falls and sanitary survey is essential for um, the interpretation of the laboratory results. The second element is sampling. Sampling of water should be uh, done with the thoroughness of a surgical operation uh, with the observation of aseptic precautions uh, and it depends upon the results of the analysis. It is carried out by the competent and trained person, uh, personnel in a strict accordance accordance with the uh, method and frequency of uh, sampling prescribed in the WHO guidelines for the drinking water quality. Now the third uh, method for uh, surveillance of drinking water quality is bacteriological surveillance and in this we run certain tests and these tests really employed in the water bacteriology for a presumptive coliform test and the test for the detection of fecal receptacle and procedural perfringence and the colony count. The complete bacteriological exam consists of all these three tests. For presumptive coliform test, we run the multiple tube method mm, test and this test is based on estimating the most probable number of coliform organisms in 100 ml of water. This test is carried out by inoculating measured quantities of sample water into the tubes of McConkey lactose bile salt broth uh, with brome cresole purple as an indicator. The tubes are incubated for 48 hours. And 
uh, for the number of tubes showing acid and gas, an estimate of um, most probable number of coliform organisms in 100 ml of the sample water can be obtained from the statistical tube and this result is known as a uh, presumptive coliform count. Uh, the another confirmatory test uh, is done to find whether the coliform are of fecal origin. In this test, samples are incubated at two temperatures, 37 degrees centigrade and uh, 44 degrees centigrade. Fecal E. coli grow at the at 44 degree uh, temperature, while non-fecal coliform do not grow at 44 degree uh, centigrade. Uh, other is a test for detection of the fecal streptococci and the Clostridium perfringens, which provide a confirmatory evidence of the fecal contamination of water. And the third uh, test is a, a colony count. A colony count on nutrient agar at 37 degree centigrade and 22 degree centigrade um, is frequently are frequently used in the bacteriological examination of water. Colony count provide an estimate of general bacterial uh, purity of the water. And a sudden increase in the colony count uh, indicates the earliest indication of the uh, con contamination. And the recommended plate count uh, for the portable, wa portable water um, uh, should be the plated count of 0 to 10 colonies. Uh, plated count of 0 to 10 colonies at 37 degrees centigrade and plated count of less than 22 greater than equal to 100 colonies at 22 degree centigrade. centigrade. However, sudden change from low to high count um, may indicate pollution, water pollution. Now the Another uh, method for surveillance of drinking water quality is biological examination. Uh, since we know that water may contain the micro or microscopic organisms such as algae, fungi, yeast, protozoa, crustaceans, um, these organisms are collectively called planktons. And the plankton organisms produce objectionable taste and odor in water. They are an index of the pollution. And the degree of pollution is assessed qualitatively and quantitatively by noting the type and number of organisms which are prevalent in the water. Uh, the next method of surveillance is the chemical surveillance. And uh, this uh, uh, method of drink, uh, surveillance of the drinking water is assuming greater importance in view of the industrial and agricultural pollutants, uh, finding their way into the raw water sources. And the tests which are uh, usually run for the chemical surveillance are the tests for the pH, color, turbidity, chlorides, ammonia, chlorine demand, and residual chlorine. These are the basic tests. The complete chemical analysis uh, would also include the analysis for the toxic metals, pesticides, persistent organic chemicals, and the radioactivity. Now this slide uh, um, is sh uh, showing the testing schedule for a community water supply for acute and the uh, chronic contaminants. In the acute, uh, 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 the minimum monitoring frequency for acute contaminants, which include the microorganisms, especially the bacteria, uh, they should be uh, monitored monthly or quarterly, depending on the system um, size and type. While viruses are uh, should be monitored continuously for turbidity on a monthly basis for total coliformis indicators. Nitrates uh, should be uh, monitored annually. Uh, naturally, uh, nitrates are naturally occurring ions that are the part of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, nitrate level an increase in the nitrate level has been observed due to the intensification of uh, farming practices so they should be monitored annually now the chronic in chronic contaminants like aromatic uh, which include the aromatic hydrocarbon benzene uh, they should be monitored annually in the ground and surface water while the pesticides 
uh, which uh, which are of uh, great importance in connection with the water quality, and it include the chlorinated hydrocarbon, uh, herbicides, pest, uh, soil insecticides. Um, they are uh, since we all know that they are added to the water supply. These pesticides are added to the water supply for disease vector uh, control. So they should be uh, monitor uh, one to twice. Uh, I mean, within three years, uh, twice within three years, and uh, inorganic metals uh, they should be monitored uh, annually in the surface water, or while in groundwater they should be monitored once in three years, and radionuclides uh, they should be monitored once every four years. Now uh, we will discuss the water pollution and their effect on the human health. So we have uh, uh, discussed uh, in previous slide as well that chemical contamination of the drinking uh, water derived from the industrial and the agriculture waste can adversely affect the human health directly and indirectly by accumulating in the aquatic life which in, in turn uses the uh, human food. For example, uh, the chemical uh, pollutants include the cyanide, heavy metal, minerals, organic acids, ammonia, bleaching agents, um, and certain nitrogenous uh, substances. Increase in the amount of nitrites and nitrate from the agriculture, uh, um, fertilizers, and, uh, in, in, and intensification of the farming practices will result in the met hemoglobinemia in infants. So met hemoglobinemia is a form of hemoglobin that has been oxidized and changing its heme iron configuration from the ferrous to the ferric state. And unlike normal hemoglobin, a met hemoglobin does not bind to the oxygen and as a result cannot deliver oxygen to the tissues. And uh, uh, the high level of nitrate and nitrides in the water can also result in, uh, in the development of the colorectal carcinoma uh, and uh, um, other um, inorganic constituent of uh, water, your, uh, pollu your water pollu uh, pollutant is lead, which is used in the water supply pipe and fittings contributed to the blood that levels in the high blood lead levels in children and adults in areas where plumbosolvency is a problem. Well, plumbosolvency is uh, basically the dissolution of metallic lead which results in the contamination of drinking water and consequent damage to the human health. It is a major problem where lead pipes or brass fittings are present in the supply route. And uh, waterborne diseases such as cholera, typhoid, hepatitis A, uh, these arise from the contamination of water by human or animal feces or urine infected by the path pathogenic bacteria or viruses, uh, which includes the, and there are certain uh, uh, protozoal infections also like amoebiasis, giardiasis and uh, bacterial and viral infections, cholera, typhoid, hepatitis A and leptospirosis. Leptospirosis may be uh, acquired through the contact of the abraded skin with the infected uh, water. Uh, now what is hardness of water? It is the amount of uh, dissolved calcium and magnesium in the water. Hardness um, may be defined as a soap destroying uh, power of the water. And uh, it is hard water is high in dissolved minerals, uh, which include the calcium and magnesium. The hardness of water is mainly because of four dissolved com compounds, which includes the calcium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate, calcium sulfate, and magnesium sulfate. Hardness are classified as carbonate and non-carbonate. The carbonate hard uh, hardness, which is called the temporary hardness, due to the presence of the calcium and magnesium bicarbonate. Whereas the non-carbonate hardness, which is um, designated as a permanent hardness, is due to the presence of the calcium and magnesium sulfates, chlorides, and nitrates. Hardness in uh, water is expressed in terms of milliequivalents per liter. 
Drinking water should be moderately hard. Softening of water is recommended when the hardness exceeds 3 equivalent, uh, 3 milli equivalent per liter or you can say 150 milligram per liter. Um, uh, as I've told you that hardness uh, will destroy, uh, is a soap destroying power of the water. So in hard water, soap reacts with the calcium which is relatively high in the hard water. And when using hard water, more soap or uh, detergent is needed to get things done uh, and clean, be it your hands, hair or uh, laundry. So, um, the in the picture you can see um, one of the uh, most common cause of uh, cloudy dishes is the hard water. Now, what is the type of hardness we have uh, discussed in the previous slide, uh, previous slide as well? That uh, hardness uh, uh, is classified as carbonate and non-carbonate hardness. Temporary hardness is also known as a carbonate hardness. It is due to the presence of the calcium and magnesium bicarbonate, and it can be removed uh, simply by boiling the water. Whereas non-carbonate hardness, which is designated as a permanent hardness, which is due to the presence of the calcium and magnesium sulfates and chlorides, it cannot be removed by boiling, but it is uh, removed by chemical treatment or process. Now, uh, how the uh, temporary and the permanent hardness is removed? Uh, there are uh, for temporary hardness uh, there are following methods through which we can remove the temporary hardness number one is boiling addition of lime addition of sodium carbonate and permuted process um, boiling removes the temporary hi hardness by expelling the carbon dioxide and precipitating the insoluble calcium carbonate it is an expensive method to soften water on a large scale second is the addition of lime lime uh, uh, softening not only reduces the total hardness but also accomplishes the magnesium reduction. Lime absorbs the carbon dioxide and precipitates the insoluble calcium carbonate. The third uh, method is addition of sodium carbonate uh, which is called the so soda ash. Sodium carbonate or soda ash removes both the temporary as well as the permanent hardness. The fourth uh, method is the permuted process or you can say the base exchange process and in the treatment of large water supplies the permuted process is used. Sodium permuted is a complex compound of sodium, aluminium and silica. It has a property of exchanging the sodium cation uh, for the calcium and magnesium ions in the water. When hard water is passed through the permuted, the calcium and magnesium ions are entirely removed by base exchange and the sodium permuted is finally converted into the calcium and magnesium permuted. By uh, this process, water can be softened to a zero hardness. And for permanent hardness, the addition of sodium carbonate, which is called the soda ash, uh, um, removes both, I have, to, uh, I have told uh, you earlier as well, it removes both the temporary as well as the permanent hardness. And the base exchange process or permuted process is the same for uh, the temporary as well as for the permanent hardness. Now, hardness in water uh, presents uh, several disadvantages both to the domestic and the industrial uh, consumers. Um, first is the hardness, uh, if the water is hard, so more soap or detergent is uh, needed to get things clean and more soap and detergent will be uh, consumed. And when hard water is heated, the carbon, uh, carbonates are precipitated and bring about the scaling of boilers which result in more fuel uh, consumption, loss of efficiency and it may uh, cause the boiler explosion. 
hard water uh, ad uh, adversely affects uh, cooking food cooked in soft water retains its natural color and appearance um now the fabric washed with soap in hard uh, water do not have a long life and there are many industrial processes where in which the hard water is unsuited and give rise to the economic loss uh, losses and hardness also shortens the life of uh, pipes and fixtures now let's have a brief look on today's session uh, we have already uh, discussed about the eutrophication eutrophication is a process by which an entire body of water become progressively enriched with mineral and nutrients uh, particularly the nitrogen and phosphorus um, biological oxygen demand is the amount of oxygen which is required to nourish a bacteria in a body of water uh, and biological oxygen demand is uh, considered as uh, one of an indicator of the water quality in case of a higher biological oxygen demand the, there will be less dissolved oxygen which would be avail available for aquatic life forms um, that dissolved oxygen is also affected by um, presence of the metals, chemicals, nitrates, temperature fluctuations, and organic life. The dissolved oxygen is affected by the water pollutant. Now, what is suspended impurities? Suspended impurities are the impurities that are partially soluble in water and kept suspended in the water. It can be a mixture of sand and the water. And it could be clay, silt, and organic and or inorganic matter. And it affects the turbidity of the water, uh, which is one of the uh, physical uh, parameter of, uh, of uh, water quality indica uh, indicator. So turbidity it include the it include the all the physical parameters which include the taste, color, and odor. Now, uh, coliform bacteria. We have discussed about the coliform bacteria. Um, that uh, coliform bacteria is a primary bacterial indicator, and uh, we have also discussed about the WHO criteria for safety of a large water supplies, um, and which uh, recommended that the coliform bacteria must not be detectable in any hundred ml of sample. Of treated water entering in the distribution system. Uh, these are the references of the today's session. Thank you.